Hello there, and welcome to Imagine Spotlights, a weekly video series co-produced by the American Diabetes Association and Beyond Type 1. I'm your host, Rob Howe, creator of the Diabetics Doing Things podcast. Every week on Imagine Spotlights, I'll talk to an amazing individual living with type 1 diabetes. Thank you for joining us, and let's get this party started. I'm very excited to introduce our special guest today. You may know him uh, from Little Fires Everywhere, on the Prince of Peoria, but I know him as Mr. Gavin Lewis. Welcome to the show, sir. Thank you so much. I, I'm super excited to be here. And uh, as, as everybody on this show, you and I both live with type 1 diabetes. So I think a great place for us to start would be just the diagnosis story, man. Uh, tell us a little bit about when you were diagnosed, and if there's a little story behind it, bring us in. Of course, yeah. Um, I was six years old when I was diagnosed, so it's been, we're coming up, uh, almost exactly 10 years now. Um, and we used to take trips down to Mexico a lot. We'd vacation down to Mexico. I think this particular trip, it was just me, my mom, and my grandma. And I would wake up in the middle of the night. Uh, of course, I'd have to use the bathroom. And then I would drink uh, three, about three-fourths of a liter of water in one go. I would just chug a whole bottle. And this was at like two in the morning. And I think that's when my mom was like, "Something, something's up here. Um, and we went home and pretty quickly got me checked out at the at the doctor and luckily they caught it and I was type one. Um, and I, uh, I know when I meet other type one diabetics, I, a common topic that comes up is the number you are, your very first number when you're diagnosed. I was a thousand. No one, Ooh. I've ever, never met anyone that's been that high. I maxed out the meter. Um, and it was a, it was a pretty crazy time. Yeah, I remember my first number as well. Mine was not quite that high. I was 425. Uh, still pretty high, but man, a thousand. That would uh, that that sounds super painful. It's funny. It's funny that you uh, that you mentioned the water piece because when I was diagnosed, I was 16 and I was an athlete. And I'll, my coaches were always telling us like, "Hey, drink more water, drink more water." Uh, and you know, at the time, I was chugging water, and I was like, "Yeah, I'm doing the best thing." Like, I, coach, come on, I'm the best. I'm the best here at drinking water. Trust that. So, turns out, just had diabetes. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, so you are an actor, a prof and, and that is your career. Obviously, you know, uh, at a young age, you are uh, leading the way there in, in Hollywood. How did you get into acting, and, and how did you decide that you that's what you wanted to do? Uh, when I was younger, I actually thought I wanted nothing to do with it, um, which is funny because both my parents are in theater, um, so I, I sort of grew up around it. I've been a part of acting my whole life. I was watching performances when I was little. I've always been homeschooled, so my parents would bring me in and I, I would do my school sort of while watching them direct and have shows. Um, and for a long time, I didn't want anything to do with it. And then one of my mom's old students sort of shifted over into TV uh, and was making a movie that just happened to have a role that kind of fit my description. And he was like, hey, I know you've got a son. Would he want to audition for this? I was like, I'll give it a shot. Um, and by some fluke, I managed to get it. Um, and on that project, I realized I think it was different enough from theater that I was like, this is interesting. Um, and for some reason, little nine-year-old me decided it would be a good idea to go up to the lead in the in the movie and be like, hey, how if I wanted to do this, what would I do? Like he told me about getting representation. I was like, hey, what what would I have to do to get representation in LA and he hooked me up with his old manager um I got a meeting with her uh and I went out to LA and I took that first meeting and I got a manager by some again crazy stroke of luck and then it sort of just snowballed from there that's super cool man it's 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 amazing how you know just saying yes to opportunities can uh, can lead you to places you didn't even know about <laughs> really can yeah um you know, it sounds like being on sets, uh, you know, pretty cool. And there's a lot of energy. Tell us what it's like. Uh, you know, do you have a favorite story about being on set that you'd be willing to share with us? Oh, let's see. I mean, for, for Prince of Peoria, that show was so much fun to film. It's the, really the first multicam I ever did like that. Um, and uh, we were all super close, all the actors. There was a basketball hoop on set uh, that we would go play on in between takes. Um, really that whole experience was just so so much fun for me because it was I love making people laugh um and it was every day I just got to experiment with uh, all these fun words they've given me to try and make people laugh and we had a live audience every Friday that I would get to tell all my jokes to um and it was really just it, it 
felt good doing a project like that and to get along with everyone so well, it was a ton of fun. That's really cool. And I think, you know, when you're, when you're on set and you're, you know, going, you mentioned live audience, there's a lot of people around, a lot of energy, uh, you know, a lot of stakes. Um, how do you integrate diabetes into part of that? Um, and if you have any tips or tricks that you use, we'd love to hear them. Yeah. Uh, for being on set, the most important thing for me is I always tell first AD um, and uh, the set medic. Um, and then, like, it depends on the show. For, for Prince Peoria, the script supervisor and the dialogue coach both knew, and they had, they were super, super kind about it. They had podiums that they would wheel around in between sets and the soundstage, and they had stashes of juice boxes in their podium, and I could just kind of signal them and be like, hey, I need a little help. Um, but for me, it was just really important to kind of let uh, the people that needed to know what was going on. Um, and I, again, just got super lucky. There's a lot of luck in this, in this business. I got super lucky with everyone I worked with that they were super kind about everything. Um, and it was just a lot of explaining. And I think sometimes for people, the explaining can kind of be a tough thing because it's very personal, right? Um, for me, I, I'm like you, I, I like to lead with it at times because I feel like if I'm ever in a, in a bind or in a pinch, uh, it's better if people know. Um, how do you approach when you go on to a new set, maybe, uh, you know, talking to different people, you mentioned the AD, uh, what had you, are you ever nervous when you're having those conversations with people? <laughs> uh, I think I've had the conversation so many times that it's, I'm sort of used to it. Um, I like to, I mean, I, I like to kind of joke about it uh, off the top. So it's not quite a heavy, such a heavy topic coming to them. Um, so it's usually something like, Hey, uh, just you're aware, I'm I'm type one diabetic. If you ever see me like pulling out a juice box and chugging a juice box in the, in in between scenes, I'm I'm not a crazy person. There's a reason for it, um, and it's I don't know. I think I've just done it so many times at this point that it's it's coming from a place of comfort, and I think I I just know that it's something that I need to do to make production feel feel better about what's going on and to make me feel safer in the environment. Um, so I think it's just an adjustment period, and the more you do it, the easier it becomes. I totally agree. And I think it's super important for people like you who are very visible in the public eye uh, and doing really big things. Uh, it's important for people watching to know that sometimes those conversations can be hard, but you do get better at them over time. And it's really important to advocate for yourself. And I think ultimately it makes it easier in the long run. Uh, so you've been on some pretty big productions, man. Like you're, you're doing some pretty cool stuff. Uh, what's, what's, your, what's the coolest experience that you've had so far? Um, and is there maybe anyone that you've gotten to meet that you're particularly excited about? I think as far as experiences on set, I had uh, a scene in particular on this last project I did, Little Fires Everywhere, that I had a one-on-one -on -one scene with Reese Witherspoon that I was so excited to film. Uh, and it was really incredible just to get to play one-on-one -on -one off of somebody that's so in the moment and so thoughtful with the character they've created and giving me so much to work with like just you can see in their eyes everything they're feeling which is so incredible to work off of as an actor um and then it was just different every take and it was really one of the best acting experiences I've ever had it was a ton of fun um and then for somebody I was excited to meet I was lucky enough to meet Harrison Ford which I was so <laughs> excited about. I think he's incredible. Um, and it was, it was a premiere of one of his latest movies that came out that I am totally blanking on the name right now, but I got to go up and shake his hand and just say, hey, I think you're amazing. You did an incredible job in this movie. And you're a big inspiration and super kind. Um, that, was a pretty, that was a pretty exciting day for me. Yeah, nothing, nothing quite tops uh, getting to shake hands with Han Solo, right? That's a pretty <laughs> cool thing. Top of the list, I agree. <laughs> Uh, that's awesome. Um, you know, as you're preparing and, and, and in your life, maybe outside of the set, uh, you know, you're a really active guy, you're exercising, I see you, you know, posting on Instagram, you know, in the gym. Uh, do you have any tips like in your everyday life, uh, maybe when you're traveling, uh, like diabetes related that you'd be willing to share with us? Yeah. Um, I mean, like you said, I, I like to be relatively active, especially in this time. Um, it gives me something to do at home. Uh, and the biggest thing I've learned about that is just being super, super attentive. Exercise is crazy on blood sugar. Um, and it's just being preemptive as far as whether I need to down a bunch of food really quick before I start exercising if my blood sugar is even a little bit on the low side um, because it, it can drop pretty quick. And then as far as travel, um, 
again, it's a lot of just the more you do it, the easier it becomes um, with going through metal detectors, which is always a little interesting of like, are they going to understand what's happening? Um, because, you know, you don't want to go through, especially the big, uh, I don't know what they're called. Yeah, the body uh, scanner, yeah. Body scanners that can mess with your pump. Um, just explaining what's happening. That is kind of a running theme with type one is sort of just explaining to people because there is a lot of miscommunication. There's a lot of misinformation out there. So it's just, hey, here's what's going on. Here's how hopefully you can help me and it shouldn't be a problem for anybody. And I think sometimes that people watching may feel like those conversations can be tough, especially when you're young and you have to have that conversation with an adult uh, or, and you know, maybe your parents aren't around, it's like a teacher or uh, somebody in charge on set. Um, you know, how do you handle those tough conversations and you have, when you have to advocate for yourself even when you're so young? Um, honestly, in my opinion, the easiest way is almost to have sort of some memorized uh, facts. I don't want to say like a memorized answer, but just kind of have a memorized phrase or two that you can sort of shape to whatever somebody's asking, uh, especially if you have a hard time just, you know, talking to people about it. Uh, it can be helpful to sort of get a phrase or two down um, that can be used anytime, anywhere, in whatever circumstances you need to. Uh, do you mind sharing? Do you have one that you'd be willing to share with us? I think that's a great, that's a great strategy, especially because sometimes when you're low, you're just not thinking as straight or not thinking as fast. Like, and it's good to have something kind of ready to go. Yeah, uh, mine is something like, um, hey, just so you know, uh, I'm type 1 diabetic. I, I carry an insulin pump and a Dexcom uh, that monitor, the Dexcom helps monitor my blood sugar. The pump is to deliver insulin. It's this little thing. Um, it's not a phone. It's, <laughs> it's to help keep me alive. Like I say, I like to kind of try and make people laugh. It makes it a little less weird and serious. Um, and it's just kind of as quickly as I can tell them as much as I can about what I have, particularly what I have on me. Um, and then the juice boxes, I've got them sitting right next to me, the juice boxes that I carry in my bag uh, and what my bag is, um, just to kind of let people know what's going on. Yeah, and I think, you know, anything that you can do quickly to, hey, explain, and like you said, there's a lot of, people have a lot of questions uh, and a lot of times, I think, when I was young, I used to get a little bit offended because sometimes the questions feel like they're pointed at you. Uh, but then I remember before I was diagnosed, I didn't know anything about diabetes. Um, and, you know, maybe these people are just curious and I'm taking it a little bit more personally. So I, I love that you have those things kind of preloaded and you're able to get all the information out in a way that's easy to understand. Um, you know, that, that's really cool. And I think part of a life with diabetes is constantly educating everybody else around you with what's going on. Um, and yeah, it's awesome that you're able to do that. Thanks. And another thing I, I like to remember when I'm talking to people that don't know much is it's, it's rarely from somebody else. It's rarely from a point of, uh, they're not blaming you for anything. It, it's always from a place of them not really knowing what's happening. So it's just kind of as kindly as I can trying to explain, especially if it's a situation like, Hey, I know you're type one diabetic so I got these sugar-free cookies and it's like, thank you. However, <laughs> I would like to eat the normal ones sitting next to them. So I think sugar cookies are, you know, when people hear about diabetes, it's probably one of the first things that they're like, oh, well, I got to be able to give Gavin a snack that he wants. Uh, it makes you think of like some of the other things that people think about with diabetes. So it's always like, oh, yeah, my grandma has diabetes or my dog has diabetes. Uh, do you ever get any like, you know, kind of common misconceptions thrown at you? I do. Uh, a, a good one is uh, a pet with type one. And it, it is, it's like, I mean, thank you for trying to relate, but it, it is a little bit different. Um, uh, and another one is like essential oils could cure you. Yeah. Or cinnamon. You put cinnamon on your, on your, on your cereal in the morning? Cumber water one time. Um, yeah, there is, there is no known cure right now, but I, like I said, I do, I do appreciate, I do appreciate people trying. Um, but, uh, they, they should, it's good to learn about what it actually is before trying to help. It's like, trust me, if it were that easy, I would have, I would have beat it already. <laughs> I would have done that. Yeah. For, for kids who are your age, uh, or maybe even were diagnosed younger, uh, and are watching this video, um, what's a piece of advice that you would give them for, you know, living with type one and, um, you know, how have you thought about living beyond your diagnosis and, and just, you know, continuing to chase your dreams, even with your diabetes? Uh, for me, I think it's just a lot of keep learning and be patient. Um, 
learning in the sense of trying to follow trends, understanding, memorizing carb counts, understanding what certain things do to my blood sugar, um, uh, insulin ratios. It's just a lot of information to take in. So the more you can learn, uh, the better. Uh, it'll make you feel more comfortable in a variety of situations, and it'll make living with it a whole lot easier. Um, and then patience is just, uh, like I said, with other people, it, and especially at the beginning, patience with um, sort of acceptance, just kind of like this is, my life has changed, uh, not necessarily for the worse, uh, nothing major, I can still do everything I want to do, it's just learning the new way you kind of have to live, um, and managing it. Yeah, I totally agree, and I think always learning is just such a great uh, a, a lifestyle uh, to have anyway, because, you know, we're all students, and there's always going to be new things for us to learn, and new challenges for us to overcome, so I really love that approach. You are, you're active, you know, you have obviously, uh, are, uh, you're, you're 16, so you're a big social media guy. Uh, what's it, what, how does it make you feel when you see other people with diabetes, uh, or, you know, meeting them on social media or, or their comments about uh, when you're talking about diabetes? What's, how, is it cool to you to be part of that community? Yeah, I love it. Um, it's, because it's sort of, if nothing else, a reminder of how many people there are like me out there. Um, and then on top of that, just to hopefully kind of inspire as many people as I can, you, you know, you can do anything you want, you can follow your dreams, you can, as cliche as it sounds, you can, you can follow your dreams, you can do whatever you want with this. Um, and it's, it was really cool on Principioria that they would let me show my medical equipment, they were totally okay with it. So there's, there's Easter eggs all over the place throughout the series, um, where I'm wearing a lot of European clothing, so a lot of the short sleeves are really short and pretty tight, and so you'll see my CGM poking out underneath my shirts. Um, and I have gotten more uh, messages on Instagram about that uh, in regards to diabetes than probably anything. Um, and I love it. Every time I get one of those messages that's like, hey, I saw your Dexcom in Prince, and it's so cool to see somebody with diabetes on TV. I, I love it so much. Like, it makes me happy to know that somebody can see that, and uh, I think it helps to normalize it. Um, and I think it's just cool for people to see, hopefully. Um, so it just makes me happy. And it's super cool as well to be involved with a production that allows you to really be you uh, as a character as well and and how important that is for other people to see uh that's just super progressive and i'm really glad that you're you know that you're leading the way there me too <laughs> we know you're involved in instagram and obviously you're you know posting content living beyond and living your life and uh you know the community is really involved in that are there any other uh accounts that you would encourage people to follow that have maybe helped you yeah, uh, one that I always go back to is Nick Jonas. Um, but I think it's really cool to watch somebody that I know is type 1 and is doing so incredibly well at what they do um, and just see them living confidently with it. And him, like, he's in such fantastic shape. He's such a such a cool artist for me to follow. And I think it's it's kind of a cool confidence boost to say, hey, somebody else has type 1. They're doing incredibly well with it. Um, and Nick Jonas, I mean, I think... It, he, on top of that, I, I met him when I was younger. I, I won a contest when I was six, newly diagnosed, but I think he helped inspire a, a big part of the way I live with type one. Yeah, I always love, because he's got such great style, right? So uh, I always love when I see can see his pump tubing, and it's like, you know, he'll be in an outfit, and he'll be like posing, and you can see his pump tubing. I'm like, yeah, I get that. Watch yeah. out for those doorknobs, my guy. <laughs> yes. Um, so, you know, you obviously like use your voice to advocate for people. Like, obviously you're, you're a leader, you're, you know, setting an example, uh, for people who are out there watching and they're like, man, you know, I would love to set an example the way that Gavin does. Uh, how would you recommend that they get started? Or, uh, you know, what would you like to, what answer would you give them to say, hey, you know, how can I be a bigger leader in my community for people with diabetes? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think a big part of it is just picking something you're passionate about, find a cause. Um, because I think that's the biggest first step you can take is finding something you're passionate about, learning about it, and then figuring out what you can do. Like I, for example, I used to uh, be really into saving the oceans. I would sell bottle cap magnets and donate everything I made to helping keep the oceans clean. Um, and I think that was a really good first step towards where I'm at now, as far as just kind of getting me used to that process. Um, so I think anything you can do as far as helping your community, uh, picking a cause, uh, picking uh, a cause you can donate to and raising money for it. 
Um, there's a ton of first steps you can take. I think learning about whatever you want to do is an excellent first step and then figuring out how you can help. Yeah, I think, you know, a life with diabetes is really like a life of advocacy, right? Mm -hmm. it, what, sometimes it's for yourself and sometimes it's for others. Um, and I'm glad that, you know, you were able to come here today and, and lift up other people by telling your story. Um, and I'm sure we're getting a ton of questions in and uh, we'll be able to, to answer those, uh, you know, after, after this is over. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, providing an example and, you know, and always learning is something that's just a great first step. Uh, and, you know, I'm just glad that you were able to take the time today to be here with us and to, you know, spend some time at camp uh, for the first time uh, and hopefully not the last. Thank you so, so much for having me. This is my first camp experience and hopefully not my last. Um, I just want to say thank you to the Onside One ADA Imagine Camp. I want to thank you, Rob. Um, and in the meantime, I will be seeing all of you on social media. <laughs> Uh, for Imagine Camp at the ADA. Uh, I'm Rob Howe, and uh, thanks for joining us. And Gavin Lewis, uh, I'd love for, you know, for uh, us to stay connected. And if, for people who don't follow you yet, uh, where can they follow you or get in touch with you on social media? Yeah, uh, my Instagram is Gavin K. Lewis. You can message me whenever you want.